Okay, we're going to get started. Um, it is a great pleasure for me to introduce to you our next three speakers that are speaking in a panel. Um, this is a really great example of all of your research dollars at work. Uh, FAST funded a rat model of Angelman syndrome to be, to be developed by our FAST FIRE team um, a few years ago. And over the last 24 months, um, almost all members of our team contributed in some way to the characterization of this rat model. And so that's super exciting information because having a higher level model in order to test drugs on to show behavioral changes with therapeutics is incredibly important to further drug development. And so we are really excited that we have that data that can really be presented thoroughly um, for the first time in a large group setting. And we are so excited to do that for you today. So the title of this talk is Characteristics of the UB3A Large Gene Deletion Rat. And our three speakers are Dr. Ed Weber. Um, he does not need an introduction from the University of South Florida. Florida, um, who is obviously was one of the founders and starters of our Fast Fire team and has been an unbelievable leader for our community. Um, Dr. Jill Silverman, who is from UC Davis, um, you're going to love her. She talks as fast as I do, so if you're not listening, start listening. Um, and she really is an expert in animal behavior, and she's super excited about the data to share with you today. And you all know also Dr. Ann Anderson, who is a pediatric epileptologist from Texas Children's Hospital and is a researcher at Baylor College of Medicine. And she's going to talk to you about seizures and EEG in the Angelman syndrome rat model. So you can begin. Uh, thanks for coming back in time to, to see the talk. Uh, but I need to give a little bit of a, a preface here. So, you know, we're, we all three are going to tag team to kind of give you the highlights of the characterization of this new rat model. Um, the rat model is called the legend rat. So this is the large E6AP gene deletion rat model. So this is a new model. Um, we've taken out the entire gene. Uh, we've spent the last two years characterizing it and we're gonna kind of tag team here and hit the highlights. Um, but we could stand up here all day and talk about all the work that we've done in this rat. It, it is an immense amount of data. Um, but I think what we're going to try and do is just kind of hit the highlights, what's relevant to you and kind of the characteristics that we're looking at and to use the rat as a way of looking at different um, uh, phenotypes or symptoms in the rat that we can try to correct with therapeutics. Okay. So, we're going to hit off the uh, right away with some hardcore science here. Um, but I, I'm going to try and kind of synthesize this down because you're going to see the science over and over again, and especially for the new parents that are in the room. Um, we hit the science because science is tough. It's difficult and it's complicated. Um, but the, the results of this, you should, you, know, you should be able to synthesize down. Um, and hopefully at the end, you'll say, oh yeah, red, red is good, black is bad. Uh, just like Allison was showing. But um, what I'm going to show here is, so this is, this is a rat brain. Uh, and what we can do to look at how synapses talk to each other is through something called electrophysiology. Okay, And so what we can do is we can take out the hippocampus and we can make a really nice slice of this hippocampus, 400 microns thick, but we do it in a way that maintains all the architecture, all the synaptic connections in the hippocampus. Okay, And some, by, by maintaining all those synaptic connections and stimulating on the presynaptic side and seeing how well the postsynaptic side understands that communication, we can kind of get an idea of, of the connectivity in the hippocampus. And the hippocampus is very important for learning and memory. Um, all of you right now are using your hippocampus to remember this talk tomorrow. So it's relevant in the, in the animal model. And the animal has all the same brain regions as a human does. So they have a hippocampus, they have a cortex, they have olfactory, they have a cerebellum. So we can kind of relate these studies and this is where these animal models really come into play. So what we've done here um, is the first thing that we look at is what's called synaptic transmission. So we give a stimulus really low and then we see what this, the uh, stimulus looks like. Oh, you can't see it. Oh, can you, you can. Okay. So this is our input output. So as we give increasing stimulations, you can see that our output gets larger and larger. And we can make measurements on what's called a, a, an excitatory postsynaptic potential. This is this communication. And from that, we can discern how well the presynaptic and postsynaptic neurons are talking to each other. Um, and we can get these graphs from this. And this little tiny bit right here doesn't seem like much. Um, but there's a difference in how well the communication is in our 
AS Legend Mouse versus our wild type littermate controls. Now we can also induce what's called synaptic plasticity. This is our cellular correlate to learning and memory, okay? So right now you're hearing my voice, it's going through your ears, your auditory cortex, and your neurons are firing at a really high rate, all right? So that gets processed through the hippocampus and is laid down in long-term memories into your cortex, basically, okay? So we can try to do that in this hippocampal slice that we've taken out of this rat. And we can do this by giving high frequency stimulation with our little electrode. Okay, and we can do this in a lot of different ways. There's a lot of different flavors to induce long-term potentiation, all right? So we can do this in 100 hertz for one second, so we're giving 100 stimulations in one second, and then we're seeing what that response is. And what we do is we measure the response after this high-frequency stimulation, and this is what we see here. So the red is our uh, legend rat, uh, the blue is our wild-type controls, um, you can see that these don't really look different after a long period of time, but if we start playing with that stimulation, we can start getting differences, okay? So now if we give two trains at 100 hertz for one second, we can start discerning differences in how well the neurons are talking to each other. And again, this is the cellular correlate for learning and memory that we can, we can actually measure in real time. So the last thing that we did was what's called theta burst stimulation, where we're giving bursts of stimulation this is a, a lot of biochemistry behind it, uh, but using this type of stimulation, we can really start to discern differences. So there's a difference in, in the plasticity in the hippocampus of our legend mouse. And this is gonna now translate when Jill and Ann start talking about uh, functional outputs like behavior and learning and memory. Um, if we start seeing differences there, this may be the cellular correlate to those alterations in that behavior. So this is really important. And when we start giving therapeutics to the rat, this is what we're looking at. And I'm gonna give a talk later on today about um, our AAV gene replacement therapy and how it changes that synaptic function, okay? So this is what we wanna see. We wanna see it come back up to normal. That means that the neurons are talking to each other in a way that they should. Um, one of the other things that I did that, that is relevant to all of you is uh, what does the gait look like in this new rat model? Um, in the old days, we used to put a, a mouse on a rotating rod, and I'm sure you've seen some of that where the rod gets faster and faster, then you see how quickly the mouse falls off. Okay, technology advances pretty quickly, and, and now we have what's called Digigate, which is this really cool system that's all computerized. It's a camera underneath the rat. You put the rat on, and it measures all these different aspects of gait. So I took out the data, but I wanna show you the film. So this is our Digigate analysis of, um, of our legend rat. So here's what a wild type animal looks like. And this is really slowed down because they walk very, very fast. But one thing that I want you to, to, to kind of see is just the gait of the rat. And you'll notice that when the rat walks, it'll, it'll have its right foot and left hind leg kind of touching at the same time. And it'll do that back and forth, okay? So just like when you walk, you know, you're, both your feet are touching at the same time, all right? So we look at all these different parameters, how wide the gate is. And Joe Greco gave a great talk yesterday about gate changes. If you want to increase your stability, you widen your gate out a little bit, okay? So this is what we see in the uh, AS rat. And you'll see some subtlety here, but you'll notice that the way that the AS rat walks, it almost always has three paws down at one time. And you can see it, can't you? I see some people shaking their heads. All right, so we can measure this, and this is quantitative. We're not observing this. We're not measuring how fast it falls off a rotating rod. We can get some really clear and concise data from doing this digidata, or this digigate, okay? So we can measure the uh, angles of the paws, and we notice that the paws of the AS rat are turned. It's weird because they don't turn in this way. They actually both turn to one direction, which is an unusual phenotype in itself. It may be a way that it, it helps with its balance. We notice that the gait is further apart on their hind legs. In the old days, the way we used to do this is we used to put black ink on their front paws and red ink on their back paws and let it run over paper. You remember those days. Okay, so this is all, it just pours out all of this data for us. So now we can look at therapeutics in this rat, we can put it on the digigate and we can get all these measurements in real time. It's, it's really a, a great thing that we can use. Okay, so we see differences in both the synaptic plasticity and also in the Stigigate. I know we don't have a lot of time here. 
Um, I just want to kind of thank the people that are that have been doing this work uh, in my lab at the University of South Florida. Um, and with that, I'm going to hand it over to Jill, and she's going to talk about some behavior. Okay. Um, thanks, Ed. That's a great introduction uh, to the, on the complicated uh, mechanisms that underlie learning and memory and some of the behavioral phenotypes that I will share with you today. Um, so we'll get started. Uh, so the, one of the advantages of doing the legend rap model is that classically most psychobiological behaviors that um, we analyze uh, were done in rats because they are a sophisticated species. They're about 90% genetically the same as humans and um, their brains are, are not that different. Um, but then a genetic revolution came around and we started using mice and everything got uh, shrunk down to mice. But rats are not just big mice. They actually are more evolved. They're more evolved in um, a lot of different ways. Uh, one way that I'm going to talk to you about is something called ultrasonic vocalizations. And what this came from is that in nature, uh, the rats need to send a signal to their mom if they're separated as uh, pups or if the mom walks away to go get food. And they need to send a signal that um, either a predator is there or that they're cold and they can't regulate themselves. Um, so they're basically calling out to the mom. Um, they do this basically through the same mechanism uh, anatomically that uh, humans do through the larynx and the vocal folds. So they're basically giving a signal out to uh, the moms. The mom hears that sound and then comes and responds. So we know that it's communication. It's not just um, an utterance. Uh, so here is what it kind of looks like in a laboratory setting where the pups are vocalizing a lot and the mom starts to come and pick them up and retrieve them because they're separated from her. And they are born very underdeveloped. Uh, they, just like our kids are, are born, they, they can't care for themselves, they can't feed themselves, they can't uh, temperature regulate, we're wrapping our, our, our children. And so uh, rap moms do all of, of those wonderful tasks for the babies. Um, and so, to, in order to measure what ultrasonic vocalizations actually are like, it doesn't, it isn't quite as cute, whereas in that photo, uh, they're in their home cage and it's nice. We have to separate the pups one at a time, and we put them in this chamber, and if you listen very carefully, you hear these little squeaks. Can everybody hear that? Okay. And so basically, this is a rat pup isolated from its mom in the chamber. And it's emitting these squeaks to say, um, I'm alone, and I can't regulate um, my body temperature, and I am looking for you. Where are you, mom? And here's what the data look like when we look at the AS rat. Uh, versus the wild type control rat, and we see that the AS rats do a lot less of this vocalization. Um, and it's not because they're, they weigh less or because they're um, or their temperature is lower. We've done all of these controls here. So the, the AS rats vocalize less. Um, this was our control where we in, uh, gave the deletion inheriting from the paternal allele, and we found that there was no difference. So this, in fact, proved that it was UBE3A coming from the maternal allele that caused that phenotype. Okay, another thing that we talked about is motor activity. Um, so this is a really quick, um, it's not as sophisticated as Digigate, but it's a, an open field. The animals move around, they run around this chamber. We get all sorts of measurements in it, uh, left and right. And then also this photo beam right up here can measure how many times they rear back on their hind limbs, and animals do this a lot. If you'll notice uh, here, the wild types, so these are the, uh, the animals that are the control typicals, they do a lot of rearing behavior when they're in the open field because they're young and they're exploring and they're like, how do I get out of here? Um, um, whereas the AS animals uh, had very low levels of, op of rearing in the open field, which we think is linked to hind limb weakness. Um, other motor outcomes, as I said, not as sophisticated as the Digicate, but uh, Ed was talking about this roto rod that we use. So it's a balance beam that starts off slow at four rotations per minute, and then we speed it up over time, goes up to 40. The animals have to learn to walk faster. It's actually quite exhausting to look at um, and to perform, I would imagine. And here we see uh, that the AS rats had substantial deficits on the classic roto rod task, corroborating everything that Ed was showing in the Digigate. 
So then again, I was seeing like how rats rule, how they're not just big mice. As juveniles and as adults, what rats do is they do this communication that is um, advanced, right? So when they're in a social situation, like when they're with a lot of other rats, or when they're playing together with rats, where rats like really play together, they play like dogs, rough and tumble play, it's really quite adorable. They make these ultrasonic vocalizations at this really high pitch. And so this is like a positive, like I'm happy, I'm enjoying this interaction, it's a positive uh, vocalization. Whereas if a rat sees a cat, which is the predator, or if you put some sort of um, like fox urine or any, anybody that could be a predator there, um, this is the vocalization you're gonna hear. So they're very different. So again, that goes back to saying that the rats can actually communicate because they use these different frequencies of communication to say different things. They have one frequency that they is a mom call when they're isolated as pups. They have one frequency when they're playing, when they're positive. They have one frequency when they're scared. Um, the last essay that I'm going to talk about, because um, we have so much to get to, is uh, who here uses an iPad or knows an iPad, has an iPhone, every single person in the room, right? So rodents can use iPads too. So here what we have is basically a simple, like it's an iPad, but it's a little more uh, sophisticated because uh, the nose of the rodent is actually not as strong and forceful as your finger. Um, so we put the animals in this task where when they do, where is the pointer? Okay, when they do various iPad tasks, like when they touch a particular selection that we ask them to, to touch as a correct response, we're going to give them strawberry milkshake reward. And if they touch the other image that we've selected as incorrect, then a bright light turns on and they don't get strawberry milkshake reward. And the advantage to using the iPads, which are in numerous, which you could all tell me about, um, for us, for the animals, it's that once we teach them to, to use the iPad, we can basically test tons of different types of learning and memory, uh, both simple and complicated. And this is what it looks like. The first video is the mouse. Um, so he starts the trial in the back here, picks the spider is correct, and then comes back and gets a strawberry milkshake reward. This is slowed down a little bit so you can see it now. Hits the spider, then gets the strawberry milkshake reward. And then he does it again, okay. And so really quick, I just wanna get to the AS rats. I know I have zero, but uh, the rats do the same exact thing. So on the left side is the wild type rat, which you'll see get a lot of trials correct. Spiders, correct there. So that's animals getting a lot of trials correct. And then this is what the AS rat is on the right side, where the plane should be correct. It's taking a little time to start. He starts the trial. The plane is correct and he picks the spider. So that's just a good example. Um, and then here's the data quantified. You see that this is how many, uh, this is the time that it took the wild type animals to complete. And uh, it was about two and a half times as long for the AS rats to complete. So this shows that um, as the circuitry that Ed just showed you, uh, that they actually do have learning and memory deficits functionally in an assay that's very translationally relevant, just an assay that's very simple that you um, and your own kids could, uh, could do as well. Um, and so those are my conclusions, and I want to thank everyone in my lab that, uh, that did all of the work, Liz and uh, Berg and Nicole Copping, and then I'm going to turn it over to Anne. She's going to talk about EEG. So, um, okay. Um, so now we'll transition into characterizing the same Angelman rats um, in terms of EEG and epilepsy. And I'm just going to show you a small part of my story. Some of you were there yesterday um, when we um, also talked about some of the EEG features of, of the rat, AS rat. 
So um, one of the um, kind of compelling um, reasons to study EEG in the rat is that we know humans with Angelman have a very specific EEG phenotype. And it's a couple of things. One is that they have um, an increase in slow activity. It's called delta. And we can quantify that. Uh, and, and we call that delta power. Um, and we're very hopeful that we can use this as a biomarker when we move into clinical studies. We also know that the Angelman mouse um, that was originally developed by Dr. Art Baudet that we've been using for a number of years in Angelman research also has this feature of increased delta power. Um, so we know we have the an one animal model. So we were very interested in understanding whether the rat had this same kind of um, EEG phenotype. And um, one benefit of the rat, as you already heard from both Jill and Ed, is that we have many years of experience with the rat and specifically in the field of epilepsy and EEG recordings and even more importantly in the immature animal. The rat pups are much bigger um, than a, a mouse pup and so we've been able to record, um, I mean in, in my postdoctoral training I was recording from rats and doing epilepsy research with them um, beginning at day seven and eight postnatally, which is very difficult to do in a mouse. So we wanted to do developmental studies and start early um, with, with the rats. And what I'll show you today is, is work starting early postnatally, but then following these animals in, in some of my studies all the way out to one year. Um, my pointer. Um, so first we're going to look at the EEG analysis and this delta power to evaluate whether they have that. Um, and then uh, screening for seizures and epileptiform activity. And for the seizure screening, since so far, at least in younger rats, we have not seen uh, any spontaneous seizures. We used uh, stimulation um, using two protocols, with um, one with chemoconvulsant. Um, an agent that um, we just refer to as PTZ, um, and then also audiogenic stimulation. And part of the reason we used audiogenic stimulation is this is a very robust phenotype in the mice. So we wanted to see if the rats had it and if it was different developmentally early versus later in their life. So this slide just summarizes looking early at two weeks, one month, and one year for uh, the EEG delta power, so that slow wave activity. And what you see at two weeks, and then again at, at, at one month, and later at one year, there is this spike in the very slow frequencies. So on the um, x-axis is uh, frequency, and you can see like probably below five hertz, which are the delta frequencies. There's a peak um, both in, in at, at all these time points compared to the wild type animals. This slide shows an animal that underwent seizure stimulation with the uh, PTC. We inject that um, intraperitoneally and then within 30 to 60 seconds, the animal has a seizure. Um, it start, it's a generalized seizure, so you can see that the animal is having clonic activity of its paws. Um, and also some tonic posturing. And what we found when we looked at one month is that um, we really didn't see a difference in the time to seizure, the length of the seizure, but we started to see this increase in recovery um, after the seizure. And then when we looked at um, four and a half to five months, we found that, again, we didn't see changes in the latency to seizure or the duration of the seizure, but now this recovery um, to going back to baseline movement was increased in, in the AS compared to the wild type uh, animals. And one of our uh, concerns is that these animals may be, after their big generalized seizure, be having may be having subclinical seizures, so there are EEG discharges, but no uh, physical manifestation, sort of the silent seizures. And we know that children with Angelman syndrome can have that type of seizure. Um, the next thing we plan to do is to evaluate them in this model with EEG monitoring. These animals we just looked 
with video and behavior. When we looked at the animals at one year of age, we saw that um, now they have a decreased latency to both the first clonic activity of their forelimbs, but also a, a decreased latency to the generalized seizure, and probably an, the, the, an increase uh, in recovery, but this was not significant. So again, one of the things we wanna do here is um, have probably a smaller cohort, but evaluate these animals with EEG in this model. Um, and then just quickly, um, as, as like the really last data slide for my talk, is um, I just wanted to show you what we found with audiogenic seizures. Um, we looked at two weeks and one month, and we didn't really see a difference at two weeks. However, at one month, the animals had, um, with audiogenic stimulation, they did not have the wild running motor seizures that we see in the rats, but they had these, this period of immobility um, that we did not see in, um, in in the wild type, and then the recovery um, to spontaneous, um, regular kind of rat behavior was increased. So again, we feel like we need to do these studies with the EG monitoring to make sure that the reason they're immobile and the reason they have this, this increased duration to recovery um, could be because of subclinical or those silent seizures. And what my lab also is working on and um, gathering data is very preliminary right now is to use the EEG and spectral analysis to look at circadian or sleep-wake cycling. And the motivation partly to do that is because we know sleep is very disrupted in Angelman syndrome and we'd like to understand that better and possibly have a biomarker there with sleep that we can use for clinical trials. And we're also looking at EEG patterns in the behaving animal. So using some of the same tests that you heard about from Jill's lab, but having simultaneous EEG to look at uh, the, the EEG patterns during behavior. There's some very characteristic patterns seen in wild type animals that if it's disrupted in Angelman, we could look at those same patterns in humans because they also have that. So uh, that just summarizes um, the data I've shown you today. And then um, I feel like what we've shown you today, like as a group, suggests that this animal um, has a lot of the features that we see in uh, humans with Angelman. It's also mimicking findings we have in the rat, but the advantage is um, the animals are smarter, they can do more complex tasks for behavior, and we can study them at young ages. So. I think we have a good model for preclinical studies and just my acknowledgements. Um, I just want to put on my clinical hat now at the very end of this talk and put a plug in for um, the registry, the Angelman Syndrome Registry. You're going to hear more about it from Megan. But we're doing all of this work because we are gearing up to do preclinical studies with treatments that then we want to bring forward to all of our Angelman community. And we need your help. We need everyone registered. Um, if you live within the United States, we now have a number of, of, um, of comprehensive Apple, um, uh, Angelman clinics. Um, we just started one at Texas Children's Hospital in Texas and at Baylor College of Medicine, but they're throughout the country. I would encourage you to contact those clinics and try to get your child seen. Um, it, it, what we're doing is trying to see everybody at least once and once a year in that clinic, but these are all starting points for getting ourselves organized on the clinical side towards um, these clinical trials. Thank you guys very much. I think we have time for a couple questions. Um, raise your hand if you have a question. Yeah? So, unfortunately, when we went to visit you, Dr. Weaver, the rats weren't there. I never really imagined I'd be excited to meet a rat. Um, but to see the drugs or the cure in the rats and how quickly they react in a month and a year, um, with a rat's life expectancy being shorter than a human's, do you feel the care will be, like in humans, will they react as quickly or will it be 
a longer, or is that something that can't be determined until its trials are brought about? Yeah, so, so the great thing about animal models, especially mice and rats, is, is they have a shorter lifespan, but you know, all the biochemical changes and things that happen to the brain, it's the same thing that happened in any mammal, but it's truncated down to two years. So we can look at long-term effects in a short period of time. So it's a subtlety with an animal model, but it's really important to think about that. So that's the other thing that Ann talked about. With, with rats, we can treat them at a much younger age. They're, they're larger when they're born young. They're easier to, to, to treat. Um, so th that's, that's one reason why the rats are, are advantageous over the mice. Um, but we can you know, treat and then look at you know, three months later in the lifetime of a human would be you know, years later. So, so it, it, it does have that advantage as well. The answer to your question is we don't know. He dodged that bullet. I, well, as far as, as far as therapeutics, we're just, yeah, we're just starting to use the rat now to look at some of these therapeutics. And so we're just starting to use the rat for you know, things like AAV um, and some of the things that we'll probably talk about later on in the afternoon. But this first part of this was to generate the rat and then characterize it, make sure that we have the foundation of what we should be looking at and, and the changes that we should be seeing once we start putting those therapeutics in. The ASOs, the AAVs, I mean, all these things we're gonna be looking at in this, in this animal model. Yeah. I have a question for Ann. Uh, we have a three-year-old angel. Uh, we've been doing uh, neurofeedback with him for about a year now. It's had a, a really big effect on uh, seizure control and on sleep and uh, on his learning and, and motor ability. And uh, neither of us are scientists. We don't quite know why it works. Um, hopefully you're familiar with neurofeed neurofeedback, and I'm wondering if you can just comment on what might be going on. Um, I, I'd love to talk to you later um, after this meeting, and I, there's another family, I think, that was telling me about that, or maybe it was you last year, but, um, <laughs> but clinically, we don't really use it as neurophysiologists. We have some people in the community that do. I don't really know much about its validation um, since I'm not trained in it, but I would love to hear more about it and hear about the specific center that's doing it. And, you know, as a therapy, um, it's, it's maybe worth considering um, and bringing in, you know, bringing here um, to further evaluate it. Um, so I'd love to talk to you, you know, offline, like later today or tomorrow. Hi, I'm Anna from Toronto, Canada. I'm here supporting my neighbor who has two beautiful 21-year-old angels. Um, they are identical, but I'm just curious and um, wondering, would the treatment be case by case? Like how would, or would, if one treatment would work for one child, would it be the same for the other, being identical? Like how would, like are there identical rats? Like I don't know how the treatment would be. Yeah, so we'll, we'll, we have a round table at the end of the day to talk about treatments and all of these types of questions. And Dr. Baudet has a great talk talking about uh, different types of children, genotypes of Angelman syndrome and how we might expect different treatments to affect those children. So let's reserve that for that group, if that's okay. Okay, perfect. Okay, thank you. Yeah, I, I would also say that this is, this is where the registry comes in as well, right? So, so knowing where, where those patients are, what their genotypes are, and, and what might be... Uh, particularly suited for a particular therapeutic, that's, that's another reason why this registry is so important. Hi. I'm not sure if I've heard anyone ask this question in the past couple years, but do our human Angelman people have audiogenic seizures? No, not that I know of. I, I haven't seen any of the angels that we take care of that have stimulation-induced seizures. Um, so, I, you know, it's a very valid point that all of us talk about that, um, you know, it's a robust phenotype in the AS mouse. It, it's, you know, it's other stimulation that will induce seizures in, in those animals, but they're stimulation-induced. So, you know, it, it's... It, it gives us an index of their, their 
like kind of epileptogenicity of their brain, and we can compare that to a wild type, and that's helpful. Um, but no, they, they don't really have stimulation-induced seizures, and there are other conditions that do, other disorders that do. Um, yeah, the, and, and, yeah the, the other issue is they don't have uh, spontaneous seizures, so um, we have to use a mechanism to induce seizures. So, okay. Um, uh, to look now. at threshold, and that's commonly done in drug development for um, anti-seizure drugs. So, as an epilepsy researcher, um, there's I have a lot of experience with that, and other labs do too that aren't just epilepsy. But there's a huge literature um, on, on these types of induced seizures. Okay. Yeah, you have the mic. Last question, then we're gonna we're gonna have to move on. Hi, I'm Sherry, and I'm wondering, for gathering the most information, which is one of the most important things I think that we can do as the parents, if we don't live near an Angelman clinic, we're getting more and more every day, but there's many of us who don't live anywhere near one. What is the next best way for us to give information besides just the global registry for everybody to know everything they need to know about our kids? That's a great question, and let's reserve that for the round table. This isn't the right group to ask that question to. Um, but we'll reserve that for the round table. Okay, great. Thank you guys so much.